Dr. Haley, thank you for joining uh, today. I really appreciate your time. And thank you to each and every one of you. Welcome back to As the Experts podcast with Alka. I am so grateful to taking out your valuable time week in, week out to listen, learn, and grow. As my commitment to you, as my community and my audience, is to help find people who are making an impact and can help us live a life more meaningful and deeper lives. My guest today is Dr. Haley Nelson. She is a neuroscientist. She is the founder of the Academy of Cognitive and Behavioral Neuroscience. She is passionate about making neuroscience more approachable and accessible. And Dr. Haley has combined her knowledge of human mind and brain health with a passion of education, teaching, and consulting, whereby neuroscience is more accessible and approachable. Dr. Nelson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I really appreciate it. I'm, ha- I'm excited to talk to you today. So Dr. Haley Nelson, do share with us How did you get started? What is your backstory? Well, how much time do we have now? (laughs) I'll try to keep (laughs) it short, (laughs) short and sweet. Um, So growing up, um, I I was always really good at math and science. And so I had that aspect of, you know, who I was, my personality, but I was also really into performing arts and theater and dance. And so I had to make a decision, which I think looking back on it was too early, you know, to try to pick which lane I wanted to go down. But I I chose the math and science route. So I went to college to become a medical doctor. I wanted to be a pediatric oncologist, of all things. And um, while I was there, I unfortunately had a traumatic incident happen to me and a personal tragedy and I was sexually assaulted, unfortunately. Um, but I ended up getting a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it rocked my world. I was I, I was experiencing things and feelings and thoughts and emotions and my behaviors. I just wasn't acting myself. And I was experiencing things that I just couldn't explain why they were happening. And so I really wanted to understand what was going on in my brain to figure out why I was acting the way that I was and feeling the way that I was. So... Um, I took and just so I was still in college and I took an intro to psychology course. And I always say the rest is history from there. I mean, my mind was just blown. I was fascinated by the concepts and I really wanted to focus more in on the biological basis of the behaviors and thoughts and really understand how the brain is able to control so much and really get into the nitty gritty details. And so after I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I did two years as a research fellow with the National Institutes of Health uh, down in Bethesda and up in Baltimore with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, where I really got to get my hands dirty, both literally and figuratively, (laughs) in (laughs) brains and really understanding. So I was doing brain dissections and looking at them under a microscope and really looking at the beautiful neurons and all the connections and how different things can change it, like drugs and mood and things like that. Wow. And so I knew I wanted to continue studying the brain. And so I applied to graduate school and I got into Johns Hopkins University, where I hold my PhD from there uh, in psychological and brain sciences. And I did five years of research and teaching and earning my degree where I also, in addition to really honing my research skills, I also discovered my passion for teaching and being an educator and helping to share this passion and excitement for the brain and my inquisitive nature to other people. And so um, after I finished my degree, I worked in industry for a couple of years. That's what brought me up to the Philadelphia area as an expert testifier. And I quickly realized that my place needed to be in front of the classroom again. So I uh, became a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania in their neuroscience program and undergraduate research coordinator. And now I'm a tenured professor of psychology at Delaware County Community College, where I just love being able to work with students from so many different diverse backgrounds and instill my passion and really hone my teaching skills as well. So my journey has been a little 
um, you know, different than uh, yeah. many people who, who go into the field of neuroscience, but truly my passion is teaching and approaching it from a way that is understandable and relatable to everybody. Cause it's Absolutely. so powerful to really understand what the brain can do. Oh, most definitely. I mean, our brain is the most complex and powerful tool and to really understand, mm -hmm. right? It's to really understand. I mean, and, and I absolutely love the field that you're in because learning about the brain, knowing that, you know, our brain is the most complex tool and how the brain plays an important role in our thoughts, our feelings, and everything that's happening in our lives. So what is the difference between the mind and the brain? Does the mind control the brain or does the brain mm -hmm. control the mind? That's the age old question. It's like the chicken and the egg, which came <laughs> right. first, right? Yeah. And so so when you're talking about the brain, it's an organ, right? It's the physical structure inside your skull. And it literally, it controls everything. If you're able to see me, hear me, jog memories, if you're able to feel the shirt on your back, if you're able to taste the foods, I mean, literally everything. If you're breathing right now, if your heart is pumping, it's because your brain is sending signals and communicating throughout the rest of your body to allow you to adapt and to function. And so when you're talking about the mind, right? So the brain is that physical structure that controls everything. And the mind is a huge part of it. So really understanding the, the brain body connection and the mind body connection and body, meaning the brain as well, because it's part of the body, but knowing that they influence each other. So if my brain, maybe the neurochemicals are off balance or the connections aren't where they're supposed to be, or I'm working on new habits, or I'm learning something, I'm literally rewiring the connections in the physical structure of the brain. And that in turn can impact how I think, how I feel, how I remember things, how I act, right? So that's affecting my mind. But the other way is also true. How I'm thinking, how I'm feeling can in turn change the wiring and the structure of my brain itself, my behaviors, my actions can shape the structure of my brain through neuroplasticity. Wow. And it's kind of a hot topic word I hear a lot of people talking about, but really that's what it is. Our neurons, which are the cells that make up our brain, are plastic, neuroplasticity. Wow. And so they're yeah. plastic, meaning they're moldable and shape. They can shape into however you know you want them to be. Right. And sometimes for our benefit and sometimes to our detriment, right? So we can right. end up having some maladaptive patterns of behaviors or thoughts that we want to change, but because our brain is so plastic, we can rewire it and to shape it to be more adaptable and to, to allow us to thrive instead of just survive or just get through day-to-day -day basis. We can really harness the power of neuroplasticity and how the brain works to our advantage. So would you say the mind is almost like um, electromagnetic field? Because how we can show so the and brain. Mold it. Yeah. So, I mean, when we're actually talking about the brain, the structure itself, how neurons work, they're actually generating electricity. So we have something that's called action potentials that occur. It takes just a couple milliseconds. It's super fast. But anytime you get some kind of stimulation and whether that's a thought that's driven from your mind or if it's a light that turns on in the room, whatever it is, it's sending that information to the neurons. And then the neurons, if the simulation is strong enough, they will generate electricity. So you literally are creating electromagnetic right. energy yeah. and fields around you every time you're doing anything. We are electric beings, right? And so the brain is controlling everything and the brain is driven by electricity. And yeah. then that electricity gets converted into a chemical signal, a chemical messenger known as neurotransmitters. And it's those neurotransmitters that everybody always talks about the dopamine and the serotonin. And that's what is sending and connecting to other neurons and other parts of our body wow. to make more signals to, you know, to create more stimulation or to slow things down, right? There's some neurotransmitters activity that can ramp things up and get us in a heightened state right. and more focus and alertness. 
And then there's other neurotransmitters that will slow us down and to inhibit our system and other cells that are nearby. So we are just walking around electromagnetic fields right. because yes. we literally are creating electricity just sitting here. If you can hear me right now, you are generating electricity. So that is so fascinating. It's really cool. So this also has an, um, an impact, I would assume, on quantum physics. What is the definition of quantum physics and how does quantum physics play a role in, um, in the mind? So that's beyond the area of focus that I, I relate to. So I think, I mean, and I don't want to speak for quantum physicists, but really looking at this energy in the universe and how it can transfer between people and within ourselves as well. Um, that's, I mean, I don't necessarily study quantum physics myself, but I know that there's a huge interest and a huge connection with neuroscience and quantum physics because of those electromagnetic properties and how we are able to generate that. And if you have ever gotten an MRI, for example, on your knee or your foot or your right. brain, um, that's using magnetic energy to image whatever organ or structure or bone or whatever it is that you're doing. Well, in regards to the brain, right? When you have that electro, that really strong, intense magnetic field and that energy, it can move the blood, which has hemoglobin, which has a lot of iron in it. So it's right. magnetic and it can move it to certain areas. So as different parts of your brain become more active with functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRIs, you can actually map out and see where the energy is being created and where it's moving, right? So as you're doing different tasks, you can see the energy literally go from one place to another. And so I think that that really caught the attention of these quantum physicists to really understand the patterns of that electrical energy, where it's going, how it's processed. And then as a neuroscientist and a behavioral and cognitive neuroscientist, I like focusing on now we have that electrical energy that was created and moved from this region to another. How does that manifest in our thoughts? How does right. that manifest in our behaviors and looking at it and from that kind of an approach? And so it's really great because neuroscience itself is such an integrated field that we use, you know, information from physics, from chemistry, from biology, yeah. from psychology, right. all of these different fields all come together to be able to create this field of neuroscience. And then of course, there's so many different subfields of it as well that you can specialize in. Exactly. So it's really integrated work. Absolutely. So what is cognitive behavioral neuroscience? Could you share as, as an example in real life what, what it is? Sure. So, um, so neuroscience is the study of neurons, right? And so the function of the brain, how it actually controls it. And cognitive cognition is the capability of looking at our both conscious and unconscious activities that shape our thoughts, shape our mood, right? Things like that, that are maybe a little bit more challenging to quantify, comparing that to behaviors that you can easily measure, right? So our behaviors, our actions, how what we actually do as a result, right? So some of the behaviors can be quite simple, like, oh, you send a signal from your brain to contract your muscles, and now you're, you raise your hand or you lift up up whatever it is that you need to do. That's mm -hmm. part of neuroscience. That's behavioral neuroscience. But then you can right. also look at more in-depth behaviors like sexual behavior and, you know, uh, maternal behavior, maternal instincts, things like that, that are influenced by different chemicals and hormones, right? So that's uh, the area of behavioral neuroscience where you can actually measure it on the organism to see how some of those chemicals and some of those signals can alter your behaviors, your outward actions. Whereas when you're studying how the brain controls your thoughts, your moods, those internal processing, both conscious as well as unconscious activity, that's more of that cognitive neuroscience. And some people go into cognitive neuroscience and study patients who've had strokes and see where their deficits are. And whereas my training is more of here's, you know, the average Joe, the average person, and how can we influence our brain through our thoughts, but also through our actions and vice versa, how our actions and our thoughts can also influence that physical structure of the brain. So it really does go hand in hand and goes in both directions. 
And then, right. so I use that information. And then of course I teach it to others so that they can use it in their life and with their practice as well. Right. So would you say that it also has, um, you know, relation to how we think, feel and choose and when we when we talk about you know what we're thinking, we're choosing, and all those three they go hand in hand. How does this play an important role in in the mind? Absolutely. So when I think of things like that, questions like that, I'm big words that are coming to mind are motivation, habit. Right. We're choosing what to do with our life. Are we going to yeah. hit snooze five more times before getting out of bed? Are we going right. to procrastinate and not submit the paperwork that we need to do for our boss or for our company, whatever mm-hmm. it is, right? Those are mm-hmm. all choices that we're making. And so the way that our brain is set up is to allow us to function in an optimal way. And that meaning automatic, right? If we have to think, really hard every single time we make a decision that will take all of our day. That will take our entire lifetime just sitting there making decisions. Brain becomes automated and we make those decisions like that, which in turn influence our actions, right? So those can become habits. And then so we set these patterns of behavior and patterns of thought, they become automatic to allow us to spend our energy focusing on other things. So what can happen is sometimes those habits, you might want to change them, right? And so now our nervous system has been optimized to allow us to procrastinate or to hit the snooze five times or to you know, speak poorly against ourselves, things like that. That's unfortunately sometimes what has happened. So now we want to change it and you're going to hit that resistance. And that's where a lot of people will say that they're talking more philosophically about resistance. But really, if you want to translate it to think of it more literally, you are getting resistance because your neurons and your nervous system is set up in an optimal way to go along the path of least resistance. And now it's like trying to push a stream up a hill. Right. It doesn't want to do that, right? You have to pump it. You have to put effort. You have to put work into it. And so there's lots of tricks to be able to get yourself out of those ruts, to get yourself motivated, to change your habits. And a lot of that has to do with altering the function of the brain through, you know, is it now that we know how the brain works, neurochemicals like dopamine, for example, they stamp in the incentive value of certain activities and thoughts and behaviors And then all of a sudden, if we can almost mimic that dopamine response by doing certain things and giving ourselves rewards, giving ourselves these incentives in a quick way, now all of a sudden it's going to allow those habits to kick in a lot quicker. Um, So I think a lot of times there's just understanding how the brain works, how it's optimized can really help ramp up and change our behaviors and our thoughts just by making simple little tiny tweaks into how we try to overcome some of the that resistance and try to make those meaningful changes in our life. Right. So what are some of the tools that people can use to making those small shifts, changes in their lives? Yeah. So, I mean, incorporating dopamine whenever you can, but obviously in And I'm not saying take dopamine supplements or start using drugs or anything like that. That's going to really flush your system with dopamine, but giving yourself those positive affirmations and that reward every time you do things and to separate them into small achievable goals so that you actually do get those dopamine hits in a more steady fashion. But really when we're talking about neuroplasticity in general, some of the key things that we have to do is repetition right? So it's, you have to repeat that action over and over and over again, ad nauseum, right? So keep doing these things. And a lot of times you have to force yourself to do it in the beginning. It's not going to be an automatic thing that we do. Think back to when we were children and learning how to brush our teeth, right? You had to have your parents hold your hand and show you how to do those things. And Mm -hmm. now as adults, you don't even think about brushing your teeth. How how could you ever go to bed without brushing your teeth? It's just, it's automatic. It just right. happens, right? You mm-hmm. don't think about it. Now, if I were to challenge you and say, 
Elka, start brushing your teeth with your left hand, assuming you're right-handed or, you know, use your yes. non-dominant hand right. to start yeah. brushing your teeth. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to start thinking about it differently, right? Exactly. So we have the repetition that becomes an automated thought or behavior, but other things that can really ramp up neuroplasticity is making it a novel change, a novel behavior, a novel thought, novel meaning new, something different. So I use that example of brushing your teeth with your left hand. And honestly, that could work for some people. Try writing in your journal with your left hand, right? right? You're going to use different parts of your brain. Different connections are going to have to be utilized in order to do something that you usually do every single day anyway. So and as a result, your brain. This is, it's challenging it. Absolutely. It's good. And yeah. And so the thing is, is think back to caveman times, right? So our nervous system is set up. We don't care about consistency, right? If the weather stays the same, that's fine. We care when we hear thunder and see lightning. We care when there's a drop in air pressure or, or, you know, the wind gust. We care about change. So our nervous system, when it experiences change, it's going to put you on high alert And it's going to start noticing things that you might not have noticed before because it's drawing your attention to your surroundings. So even just a simple task by using your non-dominant hand is going to allow your nervous system to pick up little things in your environment, little thoughts that you've kind of just ignored because it wasn't directly important. But now everything's on high alert and you're more able to notice little things. And another big thing when you're trying to make change is to tie emotions to it. You can't just say, oh, I want to lose 20 pounds because I want to look good in a bikini, right? I mean, that's one reason why. But yeah. a bigger reason why is how you're going to feel when <laughs> you're able to walk your daughter down the aisle at her yes. wedding, for example, yeah. or dance until two o'clock in the morning with What's your the partner bigger why? because you yeah. have that energy. Yeah. And how does that make you feel? Right. And so tying that emotion, remembering that emotion to that behavior, to that thought is so, 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 so powerful. And emotions have been conserved through millions and millions of years of evolution. And so there's a true value to having them. So why not utilize that to change our behaviors? Right. And there's other chemicals and supplements and things that we can do to kind of flood our brain with some of these other chemicals like neurotropic factors that I can get into and how we can naturally do that without having to take any kind of supplements. But those are just some really kind of easy and free ways that don't really require that much effort other than being conscious and aware that you have to start doing those things. Exactly. And I I think... The more we do, the more we challenge our brain. And this has got me truly excited now because I'm going to do that to challenge my using my non-dominant hand to, you know, to write or, you know, whatever that may be, but to really challenge myself. And what happens? It's not going to hurt. We need to do that. (laughs) Yeah, we need to do that to make those small changes, but to challenge our brain. Um, but I think to making those small shift, it really is going to make a huge difference in how, um, you know, it will make us feel and the thoughts that will go yeah. along and with it really that. does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I want to talk and about a lot of times people look at behaviors. Oops, sorry. Yes. sorry, I didn't mean to cut in you off. <laughs> and, yes. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just thinking a lot of times people think about behaviors because they're easy to see and other people can see those and say, hey, why did you do that? Right. But I think what really drives it, and I think this might be getting to what your, your next question is, is our thoughts and our minds. Some of the things that are not tangible, not quantifiable in the same sort of way. And we can be sitting at our desk saying all of these horrible negative things about ourselves but acting in a different way. When somebody walks in the room, we put a big smile on or we dress a certain way. We put makeup on, we do our hair, we look perfect on Instagram, right? But inside our mood is affected. Our thoughts are not happy. We're not perfect, right? We're a hot mess on the inside. <laughs> and But on the outside, we might project this perfect right. yeah. family and perfect business mm-hmm. owner and whatever it is. And so it's just as important when we're talking about habits 
and talking about doing these behavioral things to really challenge ourselves to change our thought patterns. And those habits can be just as impactful, if not more impactful, uh, to making those types of change. So understanding that emotion, understanding our mood and recognizing it. What things affect my mood differently? Look at your food, look at your activity levels, look at the people you're surrounding yourself with, look at the TV channels and programming that you're watching or books that you're reading, and just start taking an inventory on how some of those things can affect the way that you think and Mm -hmm. the way that you're speaking about yourself. And just having that awareness can really be the first step in starting to cut certain things out or reduce the amount of time and energy you spend doing those things if it's not giving you that fulfillment. It, absolutely. Uh, you talked about, you know, your surroundings and, you know, paying attention. I don't listen to the news. I mean, it's just so negative because that infiltrates, you know, you listen to the negativity on the news, etc. you know, movies, and that really affects your mind. And I rather not pay attention to that. So taking being aware of one thing, and you mentioned also how internally we, you know, we are different, but on the external, we project to our, you know, family, friends, co-workers, et cetera. So how can we begin to change our internal how can we how can someone change the viewers listening how can they begin to change if they're feeling yeah. a certain way what what can they do what what are some of the tools that they can use so that they are right. aligned so to- first and foremost yeah that they're aligned that they're in alignment with their values um so first and foremost if you are feeling your mood is down, that you might be having some mental health concerns, please, please, please go talk to a licensed mental health practitioner just to get that feedback from them because they're able to diagnose, they're able to treat, they're able to say, hey, you know, you're fine. This is just, you know, stress. Here's some tips on stress reduction or, hey, this could be something a little bit more serious. Maybe we want to change the chemistry in your brain through medicines or through different behaviors and activities that we do. Um, There's so many different options out there. So because we are all so unique and each one of us has our own baggage, so to speak, but baggage through our genetics, baggage through our biology, baggage through our chemistry, but also really importantly, baggage through our environment and our previous experiences, right? And baggage can be good or bad, right? right. So yeah. that Depends all shapes who we are. So I love to think of us, it, yeah, I love to think of each of us in a what's known as a biopsychosocial model. So looking at us as a whole is going to look at those biological issues that we might be having, looking at us from so bio psycho, psycho, not in a bad way, but psycho short for psychology. So looking at our psyche, looking at our moods and our thoughts, our personality traits, things like that. And then in a social aspect as well, who are we surrounding ourselves with? What is our community like? Are we religious and in a religious faith-based community? Are we, you know, at the gym all the time and working, you know, surrounding ourselves with people who are always trying to be better and improve, you know, or are we around a bunch of toxic people, right? So, or actual toxins in our environment as well. Maybe not toxic people, but toxins. toxins. Think about all of those things, right? So if you are feeling down and out, there are some things. The first thing is don't be afraid to ask for help ask for Absolutely. support. Mm-hmm. And there are plenty of licensed practitioners and people who can help give you that. There's also so many people out there that are in religious communities that can help counsel. There's coaches. There are, um, you know, other practitioners. There's, there's your medical doctor. There is your your coach, your teacher. Uh, you can reach out to me, right? right. Somebody who can provide a non-biased a uh, view of saying, okay, well, thank you for sharing that with me. Here's some resources that might be able to help support you. And that's why I love actually working with wellness professionals and life coaches and counselors and therapists, because there's so many different avenues that an individual can go to, to seek that support. Yes. And then what I do through a certification program is train them on the brain and how they can use neuroscience to help their clients better. So I'm educating those 
wellness providers and holistic life coaches and, you know, anybody who works with other people to give them that foundational knowledge about the brain and neuroscience and allow their clients to have better outcomes as well as have them be able to stand out in their industry as well as having that certification in cognitive and behavioral neuroscience. So the first step, again, don't be afraid to ask for help. Start doing that inventory of going through your day. What changes, you know, when you eat gluten, does that affect your mood or your energy levels when you're having dairy? You know, all of these things can contribute because we are a holistic being. We have to look at all different aspects. It's never cookie cutter. And if somebody comes up and says, oh, just take this uh, Zoloft or Paxil, you know, and I'm not one to say, no, don't take medicine. I think it's absolutely beneficial for certain individuals. Mm -hmm. But if you go and you tell somebody that you're not feeling well, and all they try to do is pump a medication in your face, that's not necessarily always the best choice. And so you want to make sure that they're asking the right questions and challenging you to think about your thoughts and your actions. And that's why I love cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, to really delve into both your thoughts and actions and how that influences your mood and vice versa. Absolutely. And I, I, I agree. Um, we need, you know, each and every one of us is different. And so the approach has to be different for each and every one. So Dr. Haley, um, is there, can we change our DNA? the chemical in the brain can we change is it possible that it can be changed and if so how can we begin to change it is and the programming in our brains it's so there's a really new field it's called epigenetics and um really what this is what they're researching and it's not that new i mean it's new and and relation to just science, scientific inquiry in general. But what they've discovered is, so we have our DNA. This is what we're born with. This is the blueprint. Think of it as literally a blueprint of uh, our architecture, right? But that DNA isn't always expressed, right? So what happens is the DNA gets eventually gets translated and transcribed into a protein, right? That's the end result. So we're creating proteins that can be neurotransmitters. It can be receptors. It can be different cells. It can be different activities, things like that. And um, so what we can do, what researchers have noticed is that certain behaviors that we do can actually stimulate and turn on different transcription factors, which will turn on different proteins, basically production of that. So so we're not necessarily changing our DNA, but what we're able to do is change what aspects of our DNA are actually created, which ones are actually expressed. And so we can do this. It was, you know, discovered with drug addiction, for example, that there's certain transcription factors that can accumulate and change the structure of our brain. So a lot of times these things have been discovered when we're looking at a disease model or we're looking at the negative consequences of it, but we can also learn to stimulate and transcribe different proteins, translate them into proteins that are going to make us more optimal, right? So to allow us to have certain behaviors and functions that are going to improve our lives. Now, the research is still relatively new. So Mm -hmm. knowing exactly like, oh, I want to always be optimistic. What do I need to do? How can I change that? You know, is is there a set tool or set thing, set transcription factor to do that? And we don't have everything mapped out to this point. But we do know that changing our thoughts can in turn change, you know, so repeating. So since repetition is really important for neuroplasticity, that's why positive affirmations can be so powerful for people. You might not believe them in the beginning, but you keep repeating it over and over and over to yourself. Eventually you start believing it. Right. And that's how you You start imagining and visualizing where you're going to be. Yeah. 20 years from now and tie that emotion to it. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to own my own private island. No, really think about how is the sun going to feel on your skin? How's the sand going to feel in your, in between your toes when you have achieved that level of success, however you want to define it and really get all of those senses tied into that visualization and then repeat that visualization every single day. And eventually your brain is going to think that that actually happened. And that becomes the 
automatic. And when you start making those mundane choices in the grocery store, to be thinking in a pattern that you've already achieved that success, right? So all of your day-to-day -day choices and decisions are going to go through that process of, oh, I've already lived this. I'm already there. Right. So your choices, your actions, your thoughts are going to fall in line with that affirmation, that visualization, that persona that you've put out there that you're thinking over and over and over in your head. So there is a lot of power to that. Exactly. So our brain can't tell the difference between real and what's fantasy. So we need to really challenge the brain to, you know, with the affirmations, as you mentioned, the tools that we need to do to see ourselves being that person, being in that place, right? Because our brain can't tell. Absolutely. The and so, yeah, so the brain, I always like to call it the perceived stimulus, right? right? So the stimulus can be there or not, but it's how you perceive it. And right. everything in our life flows through our own psychological filter, everything. We have a stressor in our environment and how we think about that stressor is going to impact everything right. else behind it, right? right? So everything flows through that psychological filter. So if you really strengthen that psychological filter, however we process and allow us to perceive things, right? If we're a very pessimistic person, the mailman delivers the mail late and, oh, I'm never going to get paid or this, you know, right. and they start yeah. catastrophizing mm -hmm. versus somebody, oh, I hope Tom, the mailman's okay. I hope there's nothing wrong. I I wonder if he's having a hard day at work. Maybe I can give him a little treat. Right? How you process and think about every single thing or somebody cuts you off on the road, you can flip them off or okay. you can just say, oh, wow, well, they must be in a rush. Maybe I should oh, slow exactly. down for them. So they can it's, get your past it's your perception. It's your perception. It's your perception. Mm -hmm. And so by changing the way that your brain is wired can allow that filter to allow you to perceive things in a different way, which is then going to set the tone for the rest of your day, the rest of your thoughts, the rest of your actions. And you can do this, you know, again, repetition, tying emotion to it, making it novel. Those are some key things. And another really key and easy thing, as long as it's medically appropriate, is to incorporate exercise into your day. Um, if you can do it every single day, great, but just the, as much as you can get in there, you know, at least three times a week, 30 minutes a day, I would right. say minimum of aerobic activity mm -hmm. has actually been shown to have the same benefits and the same effect as prescription antidepressants. Right. And so what researchers have found is that it releases a neurotropic factor or transcription factor, right. That we were talking about that it's called BDNF, uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor. Don't worry, it's a mouthful. Just know that there's a <laughs> chemical that's released when we exercise and it covers all of our brain cells. It actually works to protect them. So it prevents them from dying, but then it also helps build those connections. So while you're trying to work on your habits or your thoughts, even if it has nothing to do with your physical appearance or activity level or your physical health, uh -huh. But if you can add some of that aerobic activity, right. it actually is going to help strengthen those connections. Um, so that's a really, again, as long as it's medically appropriate for you to be able to incorporate that. And I always tell people, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> so just do the best you can. Every little bit helps. Absolutely. Every bit does help. Um, and I rather would stay away from uh, you know, medication, but go the natural route and to exercise. So absolutely. So when, we, when we, the final question, when we talk about you are the founder of the Academy of Cognitive and Behavioral Neuroscience, where is research headed towards the cognitive, cognitive and behavioral neuroscience? Where does research play right now? Every day. And mm -hmm. this, the academy that I've created next year is going to look totally different because new research is coming yes. out and new, new technology and new advancements, advancements in science. And I am trained as a researcher and from a very um, empirical based, you know, research driven philosophy that has, you know, through the rigors of, of the scientific 
inquiry and scientific method. So I, for everything, you know, it's a kind of, my husband almost laughs sometimes. He's like, can't you just go with it? And I was like, <laughs> no, I want to understand why or how this You're works curious. for everything that we do. I really, you can't just kick a soccer ball. I need to understand the mechanics behind it, right. and the, the physics yeah. behind it. And he's like, you know, sometimes he says that I just take the fun out of some things, right? But that's how I feel about cognitive and behavioral neuroscience, that this, and this is what I teach in the academy is here's the foundational knowledge that you need to know. But then as part of the curriculum, I also include current relevant research that is happening now in real time. And I continue to update the modules and the material. And once you're a student with the academy, you're always a student with the academy. So you'll have lifetime, lifetime access to it. So as new trends, as new research comes out, you'll still be one of the first to know about it, even if you're not following all the neuroscience nerds <laughs> like me, <Right. laughs> who you might look at some of those headlines and see, oh, that's that's like a foreign language to me, right? It can be very intimidating, right. but then there's people like me whose passion and mission is to make it approachable so that now you can use that knowledge in your day-to-day life. So that is something that I'm really passionate about. And I also empower my students to not be intimidated by research. And I teach them how to conduct their own literature search using reputable sites and databases that you can kind of see how to filter through some of the fake news or articles that might not necessarily be valid or reliable and find that peer-reviewed research and understand how to locate it, where to find those databases, and then how to access it as well. So that that's a lifelong skill that you can take with you for the rest of your life right. so that you don't have to wait for me to post the newest article. You can you know, find it on your own as well using reputable sites and reputable journals. So I think that that's really powerful. And that was something I definitely wanted to include as part of the curriculum in the academy. Exactly. And Dr. Haley, you are so passionate about, you know, the the neuroscience and, you know, so it it means so much to you and how you're making it more accessible and approachable so people can know more about neuroscience and how they can really help themselves in their lives and what they need to do, how they can go about My final question, Dr. Haley, is today, from all your accomplishments and what you have achieved thus far and what you are going to be achieving, if today all your files were deleted, what are the three things that you want people to learn from you? How to be a kind person. (laughs) Um, I think kindness goes a long way and some of my my three favorite traits of myself is number one, I'm a mother and I have this profound love for my children. And I know that I was born on this earth to be a mother and to raise my kids, to be kind and compassionate and empathetic with other people. Um, another thing is to be inquisitive, to always ask questions and to challenge the status quo, right? And, and, and in a mm. very respectful, way. I always tell my students that too, whether I'm face to face in a classroom or through the academy, that if there's something that just doesn't seem right or doesn't sit right, ask me about it. Right. Right. And I could be wrong, or maybe this is a hot topic of debate and we can have an intellectual discussion and debate. There's, I always say that there's, you know, every, every person, every argument, there's two sides to it, but actually there's three sides. There's your own perception, because again, everything flows through that psychological filter and we all have our own baggage that we talked about. And then there's reality, then there's the actual truth, right? And so we have to figure out what that is. And so being inquisitive to challenge the status quo, to not necessarily take, I don't know, as an official final answer. I think that if somebody asks me a question and I don't know the answer to it, maybe I, I just don't know, but then also maybe nobody knows. So I hope that inspires that curiosity in other people to then go research it in a lab, to go right. find it, to do a, a literature search and try to figure out the answer to that question. I think that that is so important important to be able to teach those skills to our children so that they can become adults who continue to ask questions and be curious to find those 
the answers and to be creative, to think outside the box instead of just in these very like strict borders and lines. Um, I don't know. Is that three? I don't know. So those are, you know, two but personalities. And then of <laughs> course, you know, just being authentic and true to yourself. And I know it's hard, but there's a lot of people out there who, you know, project themselves one way in online and, but then in reality, they're a completely different person. And those are not people I personally would want to surround myself with. So I want to put myself out there as me. And if you don't like me, if you don't like what you see online, then you're not going to like what you see in person in reality. Right. So Absolutely. I, it, but if you do like what you see online, then you are going to be drawn and like what you see in reality in person. So I think that it's really important to just be true to yourself uh -huh. and to really take that inventory on what you're doing on a daily basis and do those quarterly, you know, if, if you're in accounting field, you have quarterly budgets, do a quarterly budget on yourself and where your energy is going and make sure that you're putting your energy and your focus and attention on the things that truly bring you happiness and joy. And if you are in a career or if your business or if whatever your marriage isn't in line with that, then you can start focusing your energy on improving it. And I'm not saying go out and get a divorce, but maybe go talk to your partner or maybe, and I'm not right. saying go quit your job, but work on it. What is it that's not bringing you joy and not in alignment with who you truly are and see if you can try to repair that damage. And if you can't repair it, then maybe it is time to move on. Um, but I think it's really important to do that inventory on our personal as well as professional lives right. and not just wait till tax season, for example, to focus on our finances. You need to do that throughout the year, every single day if possible, but at least at least a couple times a year. Exactly. And Dr. Haley, that is such a valid, um, such a valid point that we all, you know, we need to take inventory. Sometimes we we forget to do it. But we need to do that on a constant and consistent basis. So, Dr. Haley, this has been such an enlightening conversation mm -hmm. about the brain, the mind, and the brain health. Where can people get in touch with you? How can they connect with you? Thank you so much. Yeah, I am on social media. <laughs> so I'm on um, pretty much everywhere, uh, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook are probably the ones that I use the most. And my um, my Screen name is at Be Well with Dr. Haley. And that's Haley with two Y's, H A Y L E Y. So Be Well with Dr. Haley. Um, I'm also on TikTok and Twitter. You can find me, it's all linked on there. But the easiest way to find me is on my website, which is academyofneuro.com. And on there, you'll have links to uh, be able to chat with me directly to join my newsletter and email list where I send out weekly little brain nuggets and neuroscience news and things like that to all my subscribers. Um, and then you can see information about the certification program, as well as some freebies on, you know, I have a resource on commonly abused drugs and a recent webinar that I did, which I'm going to post as soon as I'm done <laughs> recording this lecture with you um, on stress in the brain, uh, which was oh, wow. a, a really great webinar that I did that I think people would really benefit from hearing. So I'm going to put that out there as a freebie, a temporary freebie for people um, to grab it and um, just embrace the knowledge of the brain. And I am a real person, so feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but Academy of Neuro is my website. And then you again, you can find me on social media as well. But I'm pretty easy to find, I think. <laughs> Wonderful. That's so good. So Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and connect with Dr. Haley. She's got she's on all the social platforms. So leave us a review, subscribe to the channel. And why? Because of our guest. And if you've enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Haley Nelson, she has been incredible about the brain, the brain health, the mind, and the tools that we can use to really help and change our mind so thank you for tuning in as always to ask the experts podcast with alka connect with dr Haley nelson she truly has been incredible and we look forward to connecting with you soon so stay tuned for more as the experts podcast with alka thank you all for tuning in bye for now <laughs>